Hello, welcome once again to Footnotes, a conversation about education in Jefferson Parish with one of the people that's helping to make it happen. And today I, I have to introduce you to a, a girlfriend that I've been secretly carrying on with some time. Her name is Iona Iver, and she's in remarkably good shape for a lady who, by my calculations, is 112 years old being made in, I think, Burlington, Vermont in uh, 1875. Uh, her custodians, so to speak, are Mr. Lloyd Gomez, who's an old friend, who's done programs with us before, and Mr. Roy Cassio. And we're sitting in what is now, by legislative resolution, the official Louisiana State Firefighters Museum otherwise known as the Davy Crockett Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, the old one, down on Lafayette Street, not the new one closer to the expressway. And it's just been renovated, and it's a process of being turned into the Firefighters Museum, and we'll see a little bit of the treasures today. But the man who was here when they built the building, correct? Almost. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Lloyd, tell us something about the work that went into taking the old firehouse and uh, turning it into the museum? Our biggest problem was the fact that uh, we took over uh, after it was renovated from a fire and not renovated for the, uh, the project of making a museum out of it. And we had to tear down all of that structure and get it back to where it was back in 1856. The material used had to be all special milled in order to meet the uh, standards of the uh, National uh, Historic Area Standards. And uh, so far, we've spent, uh, what you see here, pretty close to $200,000. Now, only 56000 of that was a matching fund from the federal government. Who raised the remaining $150,000? Uh, it was raised through Aquino Games and other contributions. and. Uh, so far, the city has not given one cent to the project. All they've done is helped us in furnishing uh, labor sometime for cleaning up and of that process. And uh, the uh, parish has not given us anything except, as I stated, with the city, giving us labor help and things of that nature. So this is essentially a labor of love by Davy Crockett uh, Volunteer Fire Department right. to uh, preserve something that's really an important part of the history of Jefferson Parish. Well, you see, uh, originally, when they appointed me to try to make a museum out of this station, it was only for David Crockett. But on my investigation and further checking into it, I found out there was as much history of the houses on both sides and the one in the back as there was of this station. And that's when I organized the Gretna Historical Society because of the help needed for this type of project. In all of your titles, I should have thrown in the fact that you were president of the Gretna Historical Society, but then I would have had to <coughs> mention that you were also the man who made the first ambulance service in the parish and public safety director, and then the program would have been over. <laughs> when was the fire? I uh, remember it, but I don't remember the uh, date. Well, we had two fires at this particular station. One, one was in 1917. Right I don't remember that one. Yeah. No, right no, after no, New no, Year's Eve fire. Now, I remember that just as a very small infant. I was born in 14, so I was only three years old. And remember, maybe a little shuffle or something, but at that age, I don't say there's too much reflection there. The second fire was in 1972. That's the one I remember. Right. Right. Now, we had a little hard time getting this station on the National Register because they were trying to prove that uh, one third of the structure was not here. However, what you see here downstairs was the original, the, the studding and all. Now, the uprights of this building, well, there were no nails. It was all put in uh, peg like. In other words, uh, and after they pegged it in, they, drew, they drove a wooden plug. And that's how all of this, except what we had to replace because of the rottenness of it, uh, is that way right now. So what was damaged, if I recall, was basically like the upstairs. Uh, upstairs section. Area. All except one third, and that's under the belfry, and the belfry were not 
that much tech. But so the front of the building, as people looked at it, is pretty much as it was in 1856 when the structure was built. We have brought it back to where it was at that time, the very front, as you see it right now. Even you may see a board out in front. It was sort of like a pegboard. That was the post notice of special meetings of deaths or anything of that nature. They'd tack it on the board. So the pegboard is also out there. When the uh, structure uh, was first used, how big was the city of Gretna well, I mean, when it was first built? What were we talking about here? Well, I'd say the structure only was from uh, the river to 4th Street in, in depth. Now, how, how wide it was, I think the, the first account I had was uh, one block on the other side, a uh, U.P. Long, and Amelia Street. That's how big it was when the city first got, and it was known as Mechanicam, not Gretna. Okay, yeah. and then Mechanicam and McDonoughville and one other area, I believe, eventually combined to form the city of Gretna. That's correct. In other words, uh, just Mechanicam, the McDonoughville section and the Gretna section combined to make the, the city of Gretna as it is today. Now, I discovered, uh, just by records, that uh, the population of Gretna right now uh, is the uh, same as Philadelphia was in 1800. The population of Gretna is 20,500, and that's what the population in Philadelphia was in the uh, year 1800. When the uh, fire department was uh, organized, there were no uh, paid employees. And in fact, it was a long time before you had uh, any paid employee, who I think was the, the chauffeur for whom this, uh, no, his daughter is the one for whom the uh, steamer behind us is named. Do I have my history correct? No, no. No, I don't. No. That's what I said. I the very first chauffeur was Robert Lever. That was the father-in-law of, of Roy. I'm he was a very, a very first paid chauffeur. Oh, well, that's comparatively recent. So it's been a volunteer, you know, for uh, most of its history then. It's been a volunteer. And uh, Bob Lieber was the only paid trip for years and years, and half the time he didn't get paid because we didn't have, they didn't have the money. Uh, when was uh, your father-in-law the, uh, the first uh, employee? How far back are we going with that? We're going back to the 20s, about 1925, 26. And when we did So for the first, uh, what, what, what uh, 75 years there was, almost? Everything was completely volunteer. Completely volunteer. Yeah. Today, are there <clears throat> many paid employees, or is it still basically a volunteer organization? Only paid employees are the chauffeurs. Just the people who do the driving. Right. Everybody else volunteers. Everybody else time. volunteers. How do you get people <clears throat> to put themselves at hazard? <clears throat> now, as I mentioned a little earlier, my brother is a, is a firefighter. He's been one for about 20, 21 years or something. And I know this is a dangerous job. As a matter of fact, six months ago, he was nearly killed rescuing two children from a, a burning building. What makes a, a man a volunteer fireman? They can't just like red paint. Well, I guess it's carried on from like tradition. Years and years ago, when everything was strictly volunteer, basically that was, uh, everybody was closely knit. And when a fire broke out, they knew like a friend's house was on fire. so. Everybody joined in. And then as the years went by, it just carried on through the families. It was the old <coughs> feeling of community and neighborhood that, and neighbor helping out neighbor. Right. And today it exists because of the tradition that parents, most of the parents were volunteer firemen and, and they still want to do something for the community. So when a fireman answers a, a call uh, today, what he is is a kind of piece of living history that is, you know, extended through the life of, of, the, uh, of the parish or the community. Actually, and it's got to be at, at, like, say, February the 3rd at 25 degrees in the morning at 3 o'clock, and these volunteers jump out of their beds and go after trying to save lives and property, so it's got to be something like that. How much training do the men have? Hours and hours and hours. And the first time they signed to join the company. Let's say to... that I show up <clears throat> and despite my advanced years, you're gonna take a chance, and I'm gonna become a volunteer firefighter. What would be the first thing I would have to do after I signed the paper saying I'll volunteer? Then you would have to go to Jefferson Parish Fire Training Center and complete basic one, which is the fundamentals of firefighting, and then from then on, 
it just steps up for it. How you long is that the basic one course? How many hours? Uh, the new ruling of the company changed states the that you, uh, you join as a uh, honorary member, mm -hmm. and then you take up this basic training for about a year. Then you apply for active membership. That's, that's the steady flow as you come up the ladder. And in the basic training, you're taught the use of the equipment, and uh, I suppose you have to know a little chemistry, physics, and everything else. The training never stops. It's There's a lot of safety advancing. too involved in training. A lot of, uh, you might have seen in the olden days where people pick a hose up and they carry it. And they used to uh, uh, throw their legs over the hose and pull it mm -hmm. between their legs. Well, that's strictly a no-no today. And they found out a lot of farmers were rough to do the fact that somebody would pull it back and they'd be pulling it forward. And, you know, so that's uh, one of the things. Another thing in handling spike poles. Uh, you got a point on the end of your spike pole there, so you always got to have that point forward. You never carry it to the back, or you may end up with somebody hooked on the back of it. So you carry the spike pole with the, with the hook to the front. And it's when you're pulling down plaster and tiles and things off the ceiling, you pull it down away from you and not towards you. Because if you pull it towards you and that whole thing comes down and you, you suffocate it, you're killed under it. So, I mean, the safety factors in fire protection and fighting fires is a, a great uh, thing to be taught to volunteers. I believe that, uh, Roy, you have the distinction of being the uh, longest serving president of the Davy Crockett uh, Firefighters, uh, Volunteer Firefighters Department. You were president for 20... 23 years. 23? 24 years, actually. 23 years in one stretch. You couldn't run fast enough to take him get away. <laughs> I don't know if that, well, I couldn't find a better man. That was I don't know if that was in it. Just nobody wanted the job. What's involved in being the president of the organization? Uh, in, uh, the operation, keeping everything, the administrative part of it, the financial part to make sure that you have enough money to pay bills and you accumulate enough money to keep the equipment up and also constantly buying new equipment. And it, just a general idea of running the organization itself other than the particular part of firefighting itself. Now, a volunteer fire department, how is it funded? Where does the money come from? I got those engines and all of the equipment and the Well, buildings. fortunately, for the last few years, we have been able to pass the millage. Our city forders have helped us on that. and That supplies some of the money. We still run bingo games and other affairs. And we raise money that way also. So the, uh, the, the department is still very much voluntary and to an extent still self-supporting. Oh yes, it has to be because enough money does not come from the millers to operate. In the, uh, in the past, I, I know that uh, one, of the, one of the big uh, oh, what social events of the uh, year uh, revolved around Davy Crockett Fire Department. We talked when we were doing the Gretna Historical Program about Kite Day, and I believe we were talking a, a little earlier about some of the, uh, the competitions that volunteer fire departments used to uh, have with each other. What were some of the social advantages, if you will, of, of belonging to the organization? Well, having a fair and having these participations uh, against other fire departments, and then uh, annual installations were very nice and we have a nice uh, clubhouse that's available to the firemen after fires or whenever they feel like going there but basically most of the firemen take pride in just being part of the fire company that's what i suppose i was trying to get at you know they're not paid they do it out of a sense of service. You know, I was wondering if there was, you know, a social aspect to it that would be an incentive, but apparently no, no, I, I, this, being this is just bloody hard work right. that these people do because they like it and out of a sense the social of service. Doesn't the doesn't nowhere compensate the actual physical and everything these boys, everybody puts out for the fire department. In the years of, uh, of firefighting, it has to have changed a lot. I speak a little bit from my brother's experience, but it would seem to me that firefighting is a much more dangerous occupation today than it was you know, 50 or 100 years ago. Well, because of all the highly 
gasinous and uh, flammable materials we have today that they didn't have in earlier days. That's why the training, it's a constant training that the firemen have to go through to stay up to date on these new materials and gases and hazardous materials and everything. As the uh, community has gotten more industrialized, I'm thinking of some of the petroleum tanks that are not too far away from where we're sitting and, and some of the industry. I, I would imagine that it's just made the job ever so much more complicated. It seems to me it's got to be one thing to fight a fire in, in a burning wooden structure. Absolutely. And another thing <laughs> when you're dealing with some of those volatile and hazardous uh, chemicals. That's why you have to have personal training to diagnose what type of fires and that person takes over and, and controls it, controls the men and so they know what they're getting into. You'd, this, be, you'd be surprised how the firemen put their lives at stake when they enter a building because you don't know what's in it or whether the building is set or not. One New Year's Eve, we had a party upstairs and a fire broke out down two blocks from there. We all went, all the firemen there went to the fire and they dressed up clothes. Come to find out the building was so set that in holding the hose, you would slip with the oil on the floor. They had oil soaked floors, they had drilled holes in the floor and put oil soaked rags in the lockers on top of the holes. So if the fire had just hit that area, we'd have been cooked up in that fire. Another uh, deal where uh, I almost lost my life in a fire was down in McDonoughville. The uh, old uh, black person's house caught on fire and I was in the fire, which was raging at that time, along with another fireman. And then, uh, the fire department had a, a new man on a pumper and couldn't give us water. And the man on the hose with me said, hell, this is getting too hot, let's get out of here. He ran out and left me on the end of the hose. In the meantime, we got water. And one man cannot hold the hose a two and a half inch with any type of pressure. And the hose got away from me and I still have a scar on my leg today where the hose hit me. In the meantime, some other firemen realized I was in this building by myself. They rushed in, the hose swung back and knocked one of them in a ditch and hurt his stomach. And the other one managed to get where I was and helped me lay on top of the hose. So as I say, when a uh, volunteer fireman, he gets up two o'clock in the morning, he doesn't kiss his wife, he's in a hurry to go to a fire, uh, and he gets there, he don't know if he's coming home. Is arson a big problem with uh, fighting fires? It's a problem, but it's not a, it's not a major problem. Uh, what, what makes a person, well, I suppose monetary gain, I was gonna say, you know, what makes a person torch a building? But we have had persons that just got a big bang out of starting fire and see the fire engine come up there and everybody running around trying to put water on it. What about false alarms? Is that a problem? That used to be a great problem, but now it's been uh, tuned down plenty. With this new 9-11 system, it's, it has been tuned down. Now, besides the business of fighting fires, I believe that we also have a uh, a duty in terms of fire inspection and fire drills uh, at the schools. Who, who <coughs> functions in those roles? Is that just the same other? thing? Is this fire volunteer fireman that gets a, uh, we put them in that department and they just spend hours and hours pre-planning. So in case this particular building or this particular section catches on fire, how do you attack it? And it takes just time again, hours and hours of pre-planning. We're a educational uh, channel, of course, so you know a lot of school people uh, watch this. And sometimes a fire drill at a school is treated like maybe a holiday. Oh boy, we get out of class and all like that. But what would you say, uh, either of you, to the uh, to the students, you know, who are treating this a, as a lark and, and an excuse? What could it mean to them if the building actually went up? Mass confusion and probably loss of life. We have, every October, there's school fire drill month. And we try to instill, we, we go to these schools on a spur of the moment, they don't know when they come, they know it's gonna be in October. And when we see the fits and see, we, we notify the principal and the proper authorities, and they correct it, and hopefully it'll last till the next October when you go back. Have many schools burned while school was in session. I know 
the old Gretna Junior High, which was one of the most beautiful schools in the parish, as far as I was concerned, burned down. Uh, but with the exception of that one, are, are fires in schools a problem? No, we have, we have had them, but uh, fortunately they were all small fires and we were able to. Only, only two fires so far where the school was a complete disaster. <laughs> now, we didn't have school inspections and school drills till 1940. And I inaugurated that as Commissioner of Public Safety in the parish of Jefferson. And it was the most uh, comical thing, you'd say, yet, yet uh, critical. It's a fact that when we walked into those schools, what I did, I took the fire chief from each city, Harry Hand Kenny, and went into those schools bringing a fire truck with me. We would ask the principal to uh, ring the bell for a drill. Now down at the feet, they, uh, they didn't have a bell. They clapped their hands to come in for lunch and go out when school's over. And I said to the principal, well, you know, uh, suppose a fire broke out, would I just go in a hall and holler fire and clap my hands? The next day, the school board bought him a bell. Hmm. We went into a school in St. Uh, Catherine, Siena, up in, in the metric. And the, uh, the, the fire extinguishers had never been refilled since we placed there. And the wars ran us out to school. Hmm. We t went upstairs and took the pipe, the standby pipes in the hallways, and looked at them, and they fell off the wall. They were so rotten. So you can see, up until that time, they thought nothing about school inspections, school drills, or anything. Until we inaugurated that in a parish and in each city, every year now in September or October have these drills and inspections. I happen to have been in a school fire. It wasn't in Gretna, it was in Harvey at West Jefferson. Uh, during some uh, construction uh, renovation there, the, uh, the area that was being renovated caught on fire. And it's an experience I'll never forget to be walking down the school hall and see the flames, you know, shooting out and the smoke and all like that. And anybody who's ever been in a situation like that, I think, will always treat a school fire drill a little more seriously. In the history of the Crockett Fire Department, what was the most disastrous fire that we ever had? Well, Don't stand there like that. You showed had, me the pictures <laughs> earlier. That's well, why I asked you the alcohol, question. We had an alcohol plant and we had the Gulf yeah. Fire. We uh, had okay. this, number two school the, fire. The biggest fire we had was a pig fertilizer fire right across the street. And uh, it lasted for two weeks. It smoldered and burned for two whole weeks. And we were fortunate at that time because we were all volunteers, but there was a hobo passing through that time of the fire. And uh, he helped us and got out there and fought the fire. And then at night, he would come to sleep on top of the fire truck. And every morning, he'd go back out there with a bunch of other firemen and, uh, you know, help put some more water on different parts of a blazing up. And uh, I'd say it was a most disastrous because every house surrounding it was scorched. We have just lost a block. At One that whole time. square city The whole block. square. Completely uh, lost. And it took two weeks to bring it completely under control? Right. To bring it down to where all you have were little smoldering spots. And we'd send this hobo out there and every morning and water down the spots for it. But he did that because we fed him and he slept on top of the hose in the fire truck. But that, I'd say, it was the biggest and most disastrous. It could have wiped out the city if it kept going and going, you know? Yeah, sure. When, what year was that? Um, I guess in about 1921, 22. Yeah. Probably wasn't a whole lot of city to wipe out at the time. That's right. Uh, now, I, I referred to this earlier, and I was wrong, and you both laughed and made mock of me. Oh, we didn't do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> who was Iona Ivor? Was it the first uh, person who lived in the building? I know there's a story behind the name okay. of this fire engine behind <laughs> me. Well, Iona Ivor was a great, great aunt of mine. Oh, then I'm thinking of the wrong story. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, anyway. And uh, she was born and christened the day that they christened this old steamer. Okay. And that's why they call it. Now, Iona Ivor's father was one of the organizers of the David Crockett Fire Company. And it so happened when they bought the steamer and had the big celebration, and uh, I showed you the paper, the Gretna Courier, that carried the whole account when well, they got up in the morning and they met for breakfast and they did this and they did that. And uh, because of her birth and christening at that time, they called it the Iona Iva. 
Now, every year, if, uh, if we have a parade on May the 7th, which is our anniversary, the, a child rides the steamer and in place uh, of Iona Iona Iona. 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 Yeah. I just remembered the story I was trying to recall. We talked about this in the Gretna uh, program, but uh, Davy Crockett is the longest continuous volunteer fire department in the country. And there was a man who lived in this building and had a small son who used to sit in on the meetings to get a quorum. That's my father in law. Robert Levaugh for his chauffeur. Oh, that's your father in law. Right. To get a quorum, the young son's name is David Crockett Lieber. <laughs> That's right. And for obvious reasons. So whenever they need a quorum, they just go upstairs and get him in or, and bring him to the meeting. So, okay. he, so he's a lifelong, from day one, member. All right, I've got my, uh, my story straight now, and I right. promise I won't forget again. This is part of the, the Gretna Historical District, and the David Crockett Firehouse is in the middle. On one side is the home of, uh, one side is the home of Catherine Straley, and on the other one, of uh, Lily White Rupel. Well, I'd say William White. William White. Yeah. Lily White Rupel, of course, was also in that house. Now, the, the most important thing about this area, it is surrounded by school teachers. And it we was talked school. about that in the other yeah. program. Who lives behind now? Uh, that was Ignatius Straley House. That was my grandfather's home in the back. That was Ignatius Straley who got the property from the uh, Australia that, that owned the house next door, just like the fire company got okay. their property. Two things before we close, because we're about out of time. One is, when will the museum be open to, uh, for visits from the public, if any of the school children would like to come or something like that? Well, we propose to, uh, right now, the complete first section of, of the museum is finished. And we propose to start bringing in just relics and things from the fire department. Since this is a state museum, I will appear at the state convention in August uh, asking all the fire department throughout the state to send in anything they may have. That okay. would, you know, and that when it is ready, it. we'll announce it on this right. channel. We've Roy, quickly, we've got about 30 seconds. If someone today wants to become a volunteer firefighter, what can he do? I'd recommend him go to our central station on Lafayette Street and apply for it, because I'm sure and in his lifetime, he'll be one of the greatest things he's done. An old and honorable tradition. Uh, we don't have time for all of this. Uh, these are two books that are published by the Historical Society uh, on the history of Gretna and the Davy Crockett Fire Department. And the Iona Ivor is the oldest steamer of its kind still in the country. Thank you for joining us. Sorry we rushed at the end. Join us for another Footnotes program, a conversation about education in Jefferson Parish with one of the people who's helping to make it happen. Mm -hmm.